I'm Michael David Fox from the History Department here at Georgetown. It's really wonderful to see you here. This conference was in the works for a very long time, and to see it come to fruition is very gratifying. Uh, for the roundtable, we are going to have three distinguished panelists talking about various aspects of the state of the field in Gulag research. I'm going to briefly introduce them, and they will each speak for about um, five or 10 minutes, and then we will have open the floor to questions and comments. And so the bulk of this session actually is devoted to an interaction with the audience. Um, my friend and colleague, Oleg Chlevniuk, was originally going to come. Uh, he is one of the leading scholars, not only of the Gulag, but of Stalinism in general, and we were really looking forward to his participation. His wife is seriously ill, and he had to return to Moscow to be with her, so we are thinking about him at this time. However, he did send a text, a brief uh, statement, about the archive, characteristically for him, uh, the, the state of, of archival sources on Gulag research. And since that is, uh, he's an unparalleled expert on the topic, and the topic is of interest to many of us, I will probably um, read an, uh, his statement after the three presenters. So um, I'll go in alphabetical order. Our, um, our, our speaker here in the middle is Golfo Alexopoulos. Associate Professor at the University of South Florida. She is author of Stalin's Outcasts, Aliens, Citizens, and the Soviet State, 1926 to 1936, which examined Stalin's disenfranchisement, poli disenfranchisement policies. And also the lives and voices of the so-called licensi, those deprived of political and civil rights. She is author of some of the most noted recent pieces on the history of the Soviet Gulag, and her forthcoming book, which is under contract with Yale University Press, is tentatively entitled Human Capital, Health and Inhumanity in Stalin's Gulag. On my uh, right here, Olga Cook is Associate Professor of Russian in the Department of International Studies at Texas A&M University. She was originally going to be a moderator with me of this session. She has grace, graciously stepped in uh, as a participant. She's an authority on an intriguing complex of topics, including the Russian and European avant-garde, propaganda and dissidents in the literature and film, and the Gulag in Russian literature. Among her works in progress is a study of the literature of the early Soviet gulag, Solovki, meaning the Solovetsky camp, the prototype camp for the entire gulag. Since 2008, she has been active as editor of the journal Gulag Studies. Peter Holquist is associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He is author of a major study called Making War, Forging Revolution, Russia's Continuum of Crisis, and a forthcoming book on Russia's engagement with the international law of war. He is a leading authority on the history of Russian and Soviet political violence in comparative perspective, and in particular in pan-European perspective, and I would say a leading voice in the discussion of interpreting continuity and change in state repression from the imperial period into the Stalin era. Uh, so without further ado, I will let Golfo speak first. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to start by talking about the uh, recent historiography and the interest. Uh, okay, is this on? <laughs> okay. Is that, maybe it's off. Is it on? Oh, it's on. Oh, all right. Okay, um, Michael asked me to say a few words about the recent historiography. And as uh, many of you know, uh, there's been a lot of interest in the Gulag recently and some really wonderful work on the Gulag. Rather than go through 
all the um, wonderful authors who are working in this area, let me just address some of the questions that we have been asking in the field. Um, there are, well, first there was this, as soon as the archives opened, uh, people looked at the NKVD. And this attention to the NKVD was really inspired by Solzhenitsyn because he began his Gulag Archipelago with a discussion of Soviet political violence. And even though he acknowledged that there were many other people who were arrested and placed in the camps, he focused on the politicals and he did it very self-consciously. He said, I'm not examining every wave that fertilized the um, archipelago, he says, I'm just looking at politicals. And I think that this is what sort of set us all on this track. When Anne Applebaum wrote her work, her uh, Pulitzer Prize winning book on the Gulag, she also began with the NKVD and with Soviet uh, repression of political enemies and ended with um, 87. And uh, she said the Gulag was extended as long as the Soviet system itself. This has continued, okay? And uh, in a moment, I wanna talk about recent, uh, recent questions that we can start to ask, namely, what about the non-political offenders in the camps? So terror and totalitarianism has really directed much of our um, research, the questions about the economy, how important was the gulag to uh, the industrialization project under Stalin, questions about Prisoners themselves, once they were released, and integration, release, integration, uh, rehabilitation. And now some of the most uh, interesting work uh, being is being done in the area of memory studies, trauma uh, memory narrative. We have wonderful uh, oral histories of the gulag. Um, there are also scholars who are looking at particular uh, populations within the camps, women, children, certain ethnic groups. Now, I'd like to do what, uh, oh, there's, and there's also particular camps, studies of local um, camps. What I'd like to do is what Michelle Sart suggested, um, and that is to speak directly to students and to some of the new topics, new avenues of inquiry that we might want to pursue. Because in my view, we're just getting started. Uh, there's so much, so much has been written about the Gulag. There are so many memoirs on the camps from survivors of the camps. There's a rich literature, a rich uh, literature now on sources. Sources are being published. And yet, I, I really think that we're just getting started. Here are some possible avenues of, of research. Uh, I think we need to start looking at the court system and not just at the NKVD, because the truth is the NKVD sentenced a minority of prisoners who landed in the camps, and that the ordinary courts actually sentenced the vast majority. And this was true throughout the Stalin period. Another thing that we might want to look at is uh, food. Uh, food and the food distribution system uh, was extremely important. Starvation occurred, as Tim Snyder showed um, in his uh, wonderful book, uh, Bloodlands, uh, starvation occurred in the Ukraine not because of an absence of food, but because food was distributed in a particular way. And this was also true in the Gulag. The way that food was distributed determined who was going to live, who was going to die, and that whole sort of system of redistribution of food, of goods, of clothing, that's extremely important. So I, I think that's also a possible avenue of inquiry. The other thing we could look at are the, the colonies. You know, we've been really focused on the camps. Uh, there are 400 and some odd colonies uh, that we have uh, discovered and identified. Uh, the camps are in the, the, the tens, maybe 53, somewhere around there. So the colonies were very important. 
we can talk more about the colonies. Okay, I'll stop. The other thing, juvenile offenders, is another group I think we need to examine because many young people began their lives in the camps and some of their more uh, formative years uh, were in the camps, unfortunately. I, would also, I also think that we sh need to examine the language of uh, the, the camps more and taking from uh, Jacques Rossi a, and moving his study uh, along because there was a language not only among prisoners but there was a very unique language among those who ran the camps that really reveals their mentality. And this comes out, I think, in the work also of Viktor um, Berdinsky where you know, he puts a lot of these terms in quotation marks and that's the way that we need to, um, to use them too, not to normalize net them, not to use them as the Soviet authorities use them, uh, but to draw attention to their uniqueness and the way that these, this bureaucratic language uh, dehumanized people and constructed prisoners in a particular way. So I'll stop there. Well, I'm going to piggyback on what Golf had to say and reiterate that uh, the Gulag studies in the realm of literature is just now blossoming and there are so many avenues of exploration. We know about uh, the archives and repositories in places like Memorial and Vazrajdenia and uh, tons of materials are being published, personal diaries, memoirs, letters, autobiographies, it's just, there's just such a plethora of texts out there. And yet what I'm going to uh, just discuss briefly is um, I as a student of Gulag literature and as a teacher of Gulag literature keep going back to uh, that golden standard. I ask myself, uh, why do we keep returning to the golden standard of literary texts? Whether, whether we teach or uh, read works by Solzhenitsyn, Ginsburg, or Shalamov. Uh, Leona Toker makes the point that what distinguishes historical documents from literary works on the gulag is the difference between the typical and the typifying. Uh, she claims that while historical reports and documents will describe that which she calls common typical situations, Major works of gulag literature will make these accounts specific and exceptional by integrating stories of exceptional people. Thus, the way an author communicates his or her truth cannot be a collective experience. A survivor who employs a fictional mode, such as Shalamov, and I'd like to focus on the greatest of the writers, Shalamov, features individualized eyewitness experiences each very unique against the backdrop of camp conditions. So why do we keep going back to Shalamov? The time has come in literary studies when writers like Varlam Shalamov will be studied not merely for his insights into the gulag, but for his own sake, very much the way we studied Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. We're not going to go to Shalamov just because he exemplifies the, the, the greatest of all gulag writers. We're going to go to Shalamov because He's like, he's part of the canon. He's like Chekhov, he's like Tolstoy. So in the process of creating Novaya Proza, new prose, Shalamov argued for discarding the moralistic tracks of the Tolstoyan variety. Instead, he took the view that only a new prose, a form of artificially distanced and an unemotional text, what he called transformed documents would be able to portray the scale of camps such as Kalima. In his article on prose, Shalamov declared, and, and I'm quoting, I'm translating, and then I'll read a little bit in Russian. In place of the memoir, the Kalima tales, uh, in place of the memoir, the Kalima tales offer a new prose, a prose of living life, which at the same time becomes transformed reality, a transformed document, not the prose of a document, but prose suffered like a document. And this is the Russian citation. Ni proza dokumenta, a proza vystradanaya kak dokument. For his new prose, Shalamov might uh, invent protagonists 
who may have been based on himself, creating experiences with more immediacy and almost always tinged with irony, such as the famous ironic ending of Antic. His new biography, written by Valery Yesipov, underlines Shalama's mo most significant contribution to camp literature, namely the point that the camp is like the universe we live in. It's the whole world. Lagir mira podobin, Shalamov says. Ya pishu a lagire ne bolshe chem melvil a morye ili exuperi a nebia, he writes. I write about the camp no more than Melville writes about the sea or exuperi about the sky. And I have here a stack of reviews that uh, John Glad gave me if anyone is interested in reading the critiques uh, of, from writers as varied as John Updike and Anthony Burgess claiming that he is of the caliber of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. So here are some questions for us to ponder in the literary field. Why do we read gulag literature? Are we reading gulag literature just because it's about the gulag? What lessons does it offer about human experience? Is, is it better at imparting the lessons that we're supposed to learn than other, uh, than other literature? Uh, do we agree with the, uh, the, the uh, point that Vasily Aksyonov made that gulag literature is the defining literary genre of Russian 20th century literature. Those are just some thoughts I'd put out there. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Fofo. It's good? Good. Um, for those that know my work, um, and for those who have spent a good deal of time working in the archives on gulag top topics, you will know that I'm an interloper onto this field. My field of specialization is, is not the gulag proper. As Misha mentioned, my interest more broadly is Soviet political violence and questions of continuity and change. And it's in that light that I will be um, uh, offering some, some thoughts. Um, as my two uh, colleagues on this panel have noted, I mean, this is an era, obviously, of blossoming literature on the gulag. And I, point out in addition to filling in the uh, frames with uh, empirical material, archival material, one of the great um, and wonderful departures is an ability to now engage in investigating the whole phenomenon of the gulag with our Russian colleagues. So it's very, very wonderful to have Viktor Berinsky here. Um, and we're very sorry that Oleg Devnyuk could not be here. Um, we clearly are getting a uh, 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 a, a real sense of the scale, size, and operation of the gulag through a uh, true, I like Goffel's term, blossoming uh, literature um, on the gulag, um, for which we also uh, want to come up with, with new frames. And what I'm thinking of is um, not only what do we learn about the gulag, but what does what we learn about the gulag tell us about Russian or Soviet history and its broader arc? Um, how do understanding or situating Russian history and its development in different lenses change how we see the gulag. Um, as I um, discuss different ways to think about this, I want to lay out two analytic models for thinking of frames of the gulag um, beyond the gulag. And that is a thinking of history um, in one of two keys, history in a comparative lens, where you take uh, cases that are or are not analogous to highlight what is distinctive or similar about these two, the, the, these two phenomena. Now, this, um, these two phenomena need not be related genealogically, but they can come from like what um, is uh, uh, akin or different. A different project, a, a different project that um, also works with, with comparative cases is the project of transnational history, uh, what is sometimes called uh, histoire croisée, the study of, of uh, genealogical relationships and interaction across institutions um, and cultures. If you want uh, examples in the field of totalitarianism, I would imagine that the uh, Fitzpatrick Geyer volume, Beyond Totalitarianism, is a comparative study. Whereas uh, I think Tim Snyder has conceived of his Bloodlands project as one that is a, a transnational history, tracing the relationships and dynamism between two case studies. Um, 
Misha and I, in thinking about how to frame this uh, conference, uh, gave some thought to um, having a vantage point outside of the gulag phenomenon itself. And it's for that reason that we very much wanted to include panels um, both on the precursors to the gulag and to its legacies. When you take precursors to the gulag, I mean, the question obviously is, is, is relationship either uh, in terms of structural comparison or genealogy. And you can do this both within the sweep of Russian history, and that is what uh, Daniel Beer's paper presents us with, the question of what relationships across either the 1917 revolution or across the Stalin break exist between the gulag and previous forms of penal incarceration in Russian history, as well as a trans-historical um, uh, pan-European or indeed global comparison to systems of incarceration. We're very fortunate to have Adrian Forth's Forth, uh, uh, paper uh, to do this for us. Um, that is, um, this is a study that's uh, dichronic. It traces the gulag against other cases um, in time. Uh, Adrian Forth's paper uh, is, is wonderful because in addition to treating the British archipelago of camps, it also provides a very nice precy of one of the, the emerging literatures about incarcerated regimes in general, and that is uh, an attention to the colonial context, um, either the British or, or, or more broadly, uh, the imperial or colonial context. This is Cuba, South Africa, German Southwest Africa, for which a detailed specialist literature exists on all of these cases. Um, now what I'm gonna mention um, is not a reproach, either of the conference program or of the individual papers. But given the fact that we have um, a rubric on precursors, it's interesting to think about what blind spots we have, what is not represented in terms of continuity and change, what is missing. Um, it's striking um, that um, uh, the excellent papers we have on precursors largely end in 1905. And this creates a structural phenomenon where we sort of end the story in 1905 and then pick up again in 1930. And I'm thinking, what do we miss with this particular framing? We, we miss the, the years 1905 to 1921 in which, I need not remind you all, a, a very great deal happens. And it's, uh, uh, it, one needs to think about it, whether anything catalytic has, catalytic has happened in those years. So uh, one thing to think about is, is, is the impact, let's say, of the First World War, either uh, in, a, in a general European perspective or within Russian history in particular. Here I'm thinking uh, particularly of the work of Reinhard Nachtigl and his work on the Imperial Russia's development of the Murmansk Railroad and the mass use of POW labor as well as Central Asian internees after the 1916 rebellion, which produces a 25% mortality rate, building a railroad industrial project in the north that will later become an arena of Soviet development. Um, other scholars have pointed to um, both incarceration and displacement regimes uh, in the First World War. In the Russian case are, are obviously Joshua Sanborn and Eric Lohr. This is then followed by the paroxysm of revolution and civil war. And for an earlier literature uh, on the gulag, the, the question was, uh, uh, is it Stalin or is it Lenin? That is, do you inscribe this right into the Soviet project, or is there a qualitative break that you have with Stalin? Um, let me simply note, in a, in, in a form of self-criticism, that um, in, in, in my work I have stressed uh, the continuum of crisis from 1917 uh, or 1905 to 1921. A recent literature is asking, and I'm thinking here of uh, literature in German history by Thomas Weber, or uh, Robert Gerwart and Stefan Malinowski, that in fact the rupture point is not so much the First World War in Europe, and this could apply for Russia in general, um, but the, the um, revolution and civil war which follows it, that that, that is, is really the foundation point, the rupture point. Um, and clearly you have a Soviet emergence, and, and by, I would, would remind people, a white and anti-Soviet uh, establishment of concentration camps. Um, I think work that, that points in this direction, that is, uh, to the uh, moment of the Civil War as a crucial watershed, um, can certainly be found in the work of Nicolas Vert um, in his, his, his uh, uh, study. Um, and then what is, what is also very interesting is that, uh, at least in our uh, uh, conference program, we have, forget World War I, forget uh, Revolution and Civil War, we largely have a 1921 to 1930 lacuna. And the question uh, there is very much, um, uh, what is going on in the 1920s? Are, are there any precursors to what we will see in the gulag? Um, most notably, and Misha and I were speaking about this at uh, lunch, 
uh, the whole uh, prehistory or, or predecessor of Salaf Kiv. Um, we're fortunate to have uh, in, in our panel uh, a paper uh, by uh, uh, Dietrich Bayrau and also by Wilson Bell that, that situates the Gulag within the whole war phenomenon, World War II. Um, and so we've got a number of lenses that we can choose to flip through to think of the Gulag. Uh, was it, uh, were concentration camps uh, and the Gulag fundamentally a wartime institution, either World War I or World War II? Is it largely a colonial institution? I think we could fit Wilson Bell's paper about the development of Siberia within this, this lens. Is it a totalitarian phenomenon? in which case you clearly have the Nazi and Soviet comparison. Um, I would add other World War II comparisons, such as the Japanese or the Italians, um, Italians especially in Northern Africa, uh, but also a, a great missing case, uh, which is the case of China and its incarcerated regime. Um, again, I don't think we have to choose any of these. Any one of these choices, whether it's genealogical or comparative, would simply highlight different aspects and different particularities uh, about the Gulag. So, uh, I, I guess what I am um, hoping to say is that the sections that we have in this conference, both on precursors and on legacies, will not remain confined to those individual modules, but they will we'll be able to use them as vantage points to look back on the Gulag as an entire phenomenon. Thank you. Okay, so. We have now heard three perspectives, one on Yes, yes, I remember. One on, um, one on new topics that could be pursued, one on literature and representations of the Gulag, and one on putting this into a comparative and long-term perspective. So as I now convey Adyag Klevniuk's comments, I ask you to formulate questions and comments because we will have quite a bit of time for discussion. Um, Adyag sent me these comments I just remind you that he is, um, uh, works in the state archive of the Russian Federation as, I believe, deputy director, and is also editor and compiler of literally uh, several dozen fundamental books of archival source materials, as well as his own scholarship. So he's a real connoisseur of the archives. And the fourth piece of this um, presentation will be his remarks on archival sources, which will take me, I think, about five or ten minutes to convey. Um, he begins by saying that he would like to discuss the problem of our, meaning the scholarly community's dependence, uh, the dependence of the historiography of the Gulag on the available sources. It is, obviously, it is obvious that initially the gulag was studied on the basis of memoirs. Um, it is obvious that the archives of the gulag have been our priority in the last 20 years, and that's why we are so sensitive to gaps in the archives. It is important to understand what are the reasons and what is the nature of those gaps. First of all, we now know that the documents of the gulag are divided between different archives. Let's start with a central level. Documents of the gulag itself, he means the fond of the chief administration of corrective labor camps from the state archive of the Russian Federation, have been most actively used in recent years. Thanks to this fond, this collection, we've received, the information, we've received information about the structures of the gulag and general statistics on the gulag. Unfortunately, however, we do not have normal access to the archives of the security service, the former KGB, and the Ministry of Internal Affairs. I would also like to remind you, when I say I, it's the voice of Alia Klevniuk, of course, I would also like to remind you that the Soviet, Un Soviet Union was a dual system, the system of the party state. The documents of the party structures of the Gulag are stored in the former Communist Party ar archives with limited access. There is more or less the same structure of Gulag archives on the regional level. As for access to regional archives, as far as I know, it depends on the local conditions and circumstances. It is important to stress that the material of the police operation departments of the Gulag are closed almost completely. 
This is a very significant set of documents. They contain some information about the situation in the camps, about the network of informers in the camps, and so on. In general, this is an important source of social information about the Gulag, which we really don't have enough of. As we know, the archives of the Soviet period, including the archives of the Gulag, have not survived in their original fullness. There were two types of archival cleansing. The first was extraordinary cleansing. A good example is the destruction of documents in the, in the period of wartime evacuation, meaning World War II. The second type of archival cleansing had more or less a regular character. According to the rules, certain types of documents were not subject to long-term storage. For this reason, Gulag archival collections contain primary regulatory pa primarily regulatory papers, orders and instructions, statistical reports, memoranda on camp economy, and so forth. Missing, as a rule, is social information. For example, such important materials as written complaints from Gulag prisoners. By the way, this was a huge set of documents. According to an internal investigation uh, in 1938, the Gulag apparatus received more than 20,000 prisoner complaints per month. All of them, according to the rules, were destroyed as unimportant documents. This situation reveals the divergence of interests between bureaucrats and historians. For bureaucrats concerned with the smooth operation of the system, it was important to preserve both government resolutions and NKVD directives. Historians want reports and accounts from local NKVD boards, correspondence related to convicts' complaints, and other non-procedural materials. The archives of the repressive organs provide a good opportunity to recreate the bureaucratic history of the Gulag, its penal departments, and its substructures. We have achieved the greatest success in the study of those questions. But to extract from dry orders, instructions, memoranda, and reports information about the real situation in the camps, about Kulak settlements, colonies, and prisons, and to fill in the history of the Gulag with events, with individuals, and with problems, a patient search is necessary. This is an important reason for the relatively weak study of, so to say, the sociology of the Gulag. Uh, we all hope, of course, that the still closed um, parts of the archives of the Gulag will be open in the foreseeable future. We could expect that such new archival documents would give renewed impetus to the development of the social history of the Gulag. So that is the statement from Aliel Klevniuk. And uh, the floor is now open to questions and comments to any of our panelists. And if you don't have any questions, I certainly do. David. I'll just make a, a comment to those here. I was just quickly looking at, at um, it's, um, a uh, Alan Force's paper to see how far back he goes with the whole, the whole question of the of, of, of pre-modern uh, pre-modern gulags, and he, he, he'll take, take us back to the era of, of maybe the French Revolution with the, with, with the Vendée prisoners and so forth. It just struck me in my head when I was thinking about this that one can connect with the history of both slavery and some very early colonization gulag-like experiences. For example, the slaves who worked in the mines that we know about from Greco-Roman times. Another example would be people on the galleys, slaves on galley ships. And then, in, sen in the sense, the slave ship itself, or the way that the British, the, or the English in the 16th century were treating the so-called wild Irishmen, in constant, so that actually there may be even a deeper prehistory of this than, uh, than 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 we're suggesting. So again, just just throw that idea out. Peter, do you want to? Add that? Uh, that, that's certainly uh, the case, and uh, you know, various protagonists make these comparisons. Um, I mean, clearly when, when, say, Kulak's identified Soviet rule as second serfdom, they're thinking of a previous regime. I, I point one, one scholar who's, who's worked on this in the emerging early capitalist world is Alessandro Stanziani and is concerned with the regimes of unfree labor. All I would say to this is that um, 
one uh, can ask different questions of those comparisons. One is whether these historical actors were studying in the Stalinist era cared or saw any precedents in the past, whether there's any genealogical connection. The second, it would simply be a structural comparison, and that's the question whether wartime causes modern states to use labor in certain ways, whether there's the colonial model and that the idea of certain spaces and certain legal regimes lead states without studying one another to similar solutions. Aiden, your paper was invoked. Do you want to add anything here? Um, yeah, hi, I'm Aiden. Uh, Peter says he's an interloper, but I'm even more of one <laughs> study British history. Um, yeah, I, I don't push it back that far. I, I think that there are certain, I, I mean, I, I think there's definitely connections. I think there's also certain things about, um, about modernity, um, which are related to, to camps um, of, of all sorts. Um, there's, um, th there's a certain way in which um, there's sort of a, a organization by a modern bureaucratic state on, on sort of a mass scale, which I think is important to, to the sort of camps I'm interested in and, and to the Gulag itself. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that that can possibly be pushed back, sort of slave galleries and so on. At the same time, you know, in, in the big scheme of things, it depends how big, big picture we want to get. So um, I, I think it's, it's, it's useful. Um, it's the, the closer we get to the 20th century, the more useful the comparisons get. Other questions, comments? Yeah, I just. Um, I think you just uh, identified yes, yourself. Yes, I'm sorry. My name is Suzanne Sternfall. I'm an independent historian, currently residing in Moscow. And uh, with respect to uh, these comparisons of the way uh, slave labor was used in the past versus the gulag, um, I think that um, one question that is also worth discussing is whether or not the Soviet gulag is sui generis, or is it something you know that has existed in some fashion before? And I think that if the assumption or is made that it is sui generis phenomenon, that there hasn't been in history a situation in which a government develops an enormous uh, bureaucracy against its own people, you know, for, for reasons that are still not totally answered and the economic uh, argument isn't all that compelling, I think that, uh, some, I think that is even worth discussing. I mean, how odd and how weird is the Soviet gulag to begin with? Because I find it myself, I mean, when you're comparing it to these other forms of uh, labor, slave labor, that somehow, in my view, it sort of diminishes. I mean, not that those weren't horrible systems as well, but the atrocity of the gulag, I think, cannot be really compared, just like the atrocity of the Holocaust also cannot be compared, although atrocities have happened with the uh, Armenians and the Turks and so on. But I mean, there, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult and slippery question. And I think that has to be somewhat dealt with because it's difficult then to just bunch everything together in my view. This is an important question. It has to do with the comparability and the uniqueness of the gulag and by extension one could say the Nazi uh -huh. uh, extermination and other camps. And I would say from my part that one can as a historian recognize elements of continuity to say all the contexts and precursors that Peter mentioned, World War I, forced labor, but also recognize uniqueness and distinctiveness at the same time, that the two are not entirely mutually exclusive. What then, the question becomes, was the distinctiveness and uniqueness of the gulag. Well, some of this is addressed in the conclusion of, again, Aiden Forth's paper, where, I mean, ex instead of extraordinary measures, these camps were built into the very functioning of the system and were a permanent part as until they were dismantled, whereas in many cases there were wartime emergencies, there were so-called states of exception. The other thing is the sheer scale of it. And the question that I would add from our, to our panelists is to address the debate about 
the, um, the function, the functions of the gulag, because as many of our paper givers had noted, there's a strong connection between Stalinist economics and industrialization and the creation, the initial creation of the gulag, the expansion of the gulag in the late 1920s. And despite the fact that the gulag was losing lots of money and was unprofitable, um, it still remained a vast part of the, uh, uh, a very significant part of the Soviet economy. But there's also a penal function, isolating and punishing and interring. Um, there's also, uh, as uh, Steve Barnes, who is here, has argued an ideological, potentially ideological function, or at least one can interpret the gulag in terms of Stalinist ideology. And we've heard this morning from Alexander Etkin that regardless of the, uh, the intent of the creators, it was a system that effectively was a system of torture, that is to say, mm -hmm. punishment. So there's a big debate on the questions of the multiple facets and functions of the gulag, and maybe this will also spark some response from our panelists. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd like to address the question about uniqueness and uh, does this fit in a slavery model? What's, what has struck me most about the gulag uh, is that food was only given to those who exceeded, met or exceeded their production targets. In a standard concentration camp system, I mean, if you read like Christopher Browning's latest book, Remembering Survival on a Nazi concentration camp, people were fed pretty much the same. And then once their health started to deteriorate, those who were naturally physically weak, they were then removed and sent to Treblinka and el elsewhere for extermination. In the gulag, your food, your very livelihood depended on your production. And the, those who ran the camps were very concerned about people getting too much. Okay, so if there was ever an instance, and I've come across this in the documents, where a, a more local camp official says, you know, my, my men are doing great because they're, we feed them in the morning and in the evening at the camp, and then at lunch, since they're being contracted out by this ministry, they also get lunch um, on the, uh, the back of this uh, ministry, funded by this ministry. And so the higher ups in the gulag say, oh, oh, no, 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 that's not what we want. Mm -hmm. that, that's bad. That's, that's teaching them to be lazy. They're getting too much. So this use of food as a, uh, as a tool, as a, as a tool, as a, as a way to motiv motivate prisoners, this is in their own sort of mentality. They thought they were actually motivating people this way, but they thought food was an incentive. And food was also a punishment. So that, I think, is really unique. I haven't seen that in other uh, contexts. Um, on the subject of functions, I, I, I agree with, with Misha that, that this is a very heterogeneous phenomenon. And there were many different functions. And in each era, there was a different justification for the gulag. Uh, but I do think that the economic, there was something about the economic function that, that seems to dominate. And I don't think it, it excludes these other issues because their ideology was economic. I mean, I often, what troubles me often in the literature is that we tend to um, divide economics and politics, but their politics was economics. You know, they, in the whole industrialization project, was a political project, that was an ideological project. And so they wanted you know, to move people to colonize areas, to, uh, to build this modern society. That's what I think was the fundamental uh, goal. The, so I'll let someone else speak. Okay. Judith has a hand up. Um, yes, please, Judith Ballot. Yes, um, I'm, a, um, I'm not a historian, nor, nor do I work on the Gulag. So, um, and I, uh, you know, when I was preparing for this conference, I had to catch up on a lot of the Gulag literature. 
you mind standing up and turning a yeah. little bit? So, just so we can hear you, okay. yes. Um, so, um, I mean, the only point I, I've got lots of points, and we're going to have the opportunity over the next couple of days to, to make them, but it does seem to me that when you were talking about transnational and, mm -hmm. and other uh, and comparative work, I think what was missing mm -hmm. was the idea of inter- and multidisciplinary approaches to right. the gulag. And it did strike me, looking at uh, most of the papers, right. that they are historians, Historical. and it's history doing it. And I would say a, a lot of this work seems to me to be somewhat under-theorized, uh -huh. and I think a dialogue with other disciplines would, um, I think, enrich the, the, the work of historians. And I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I, I really don't have a lot of right to be saying the things I am, but um, certainly, I think, uh, and it's clear from my paper, if you, you've got around to reading it, mm -hmm. um, is that you know one of the dialogues you should be having, or we should be having, is with prison sociology, with criminology. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one of the points mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, it might be that the reason why the economic is so privileged in the discussion of the gulag mm -hmm. is because, of course, a lot of us have come out of mm -hmm. um, political economy backgrounds, mm -hmm. of this discussion we had from the 1970s onwards with the Soviets about Marxism. It's mm -hmm. inevitable that we're looking at political mm -hmm. economy. Mm -hmm. But so I'm suggesting mm -hmm. that, you know, we, we start having a dialogue also mm -hmm. with people who are looking at other prison systems. Um, I've been very impressed in the, in the, mm -hmm. um, the history that I've now been catching up on very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, at the uh, sort of proposition, or I sort of find it most interesting, this proposition that, in fact, the gulag was mm. a system of punishment. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of find myself saying, oh, but what do these historians understand as punishment? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I'm having a, mm -hmm. finding an answer to that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the, the mm. points I'd make. I just got one other one. Um, in terms of your list, Golfer, I mean, we can all add lots oh, of other please, things to it. Please, add. But please one add. of the things that I think was very striking that you missed out, and of course it was the, the topic we all became very bored with, which is numbers, numbers, you know, how many people. Oh, right. But of course, when we're defining penal systems as either harsh or mild, there's a quantitative element. So high imprisonment mm -hmm. regimes are very, very, uh, you know, where, where you're putting a lot of people in prison. And some of those, was it already this morning? Were numbers being quoted this morning? <laughs> no, it was yeah. one of the papers I was yeah, reading on the, the plane papers. yesterday. I'm sorry, <laughs> yes, yeah. But, but I wonder whether we don't need to revisit numbers in right. terms of rates of incarceration and so on in our comparative studies. Now there are some very, very uncomfortable conclusions we can come to when doing that. When, for mm -hmm. example, we compare rates of imprisonment in the USA, for example, today uh, with some of the, the gulag rates, you know, how do we handle that? You know, gulag rates were what, oh, it was, yes, the paper, it was Victor's paper I was reading on the plane yes. yesterday. A thousand or so uh, per hundred thousand population. That's a very, very high rate of imprisonment. USA Today, 800 per 100,000, mm -hmm. you know, how do we cope with, mm -hmm. with that? And then, of course, there's that other interesting work that's just come out from the German historians, isn't there, where they've started counting the actual number of camps, and in our case, it would be colonies and so mm -hmm. on. Right. You know, I wonder if we go and we start counting the mm -hmm. number of colonies, at Dillenie, we start, up, it's a project I've been involved with, <laughs> memorial plotting, where the actual mm -hmm. camps and colonies were, in the different oblasts during the period of the gulag. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether we might actually find that the numbers were mm -hmm. substantially greater or less yeah. or the same mm -hmm. as yeah. those ones we've come to well, recently. The yeah. same thing is going on, I think, when you discuss incarceration, you're talking about numbers of those in prison. What about the numbers who have died? Why is it that we still are not able to get a grasp on the numbers? Uh, in Applebaum, you know, leaves the question, right, how many, it's not answered for us. And I think that Golfo has uh, proved, I, I, I hope you don't mind I'm jumping the gun with your paper, which I read, that even in the case of, of all these people who were forced to leave the camps when they were on their dying beds, they were already dying like dogs, they didn't want to count those people as the dead, right? So they, they end up dying uh, within weeks of, of, of being released. Those are not figured into the, uh, the account. So I think that's a, a very important issue is how many, how many died? We don't know. 
When are we going to find out? Sasha, if you could just stand up and face the crowd. Uh, uh, I, I'm addressing you as Oleg Klevniuk, uh, and uh, that was a very interesting point that he made, and I think it's a new point about this 20,000 complaints that were filed and destroyed every month. So that's a huge amount of documentation. If my math is right, that would amount to one million complaints over four years. One million papers you know, every four years. Like. Uh, and uh, it was done kind of in a consistent way with some kind of a legal or paralegal idea of what they were doing. And Hlevniuk uh, uh, calls it like bureaucratic history of the Gulag uh, versus social history of the Gulag. But I think it's kind of could be also rendered as this uh, 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 purposeful des destruction of the victim's memory, a victim's mm -hmm. voice, victim's point of view, uh, and preservation of the perpetrators of the official bureaucratic uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me just add, when I was uh, working on the 1920s, I looked and looked for these wall newspapers that were written in almost every Soviet institution, often by hand, as kind of a unique inside view from, P and it, it has a lot to do with statism, that these were most of them just discarded because they were not considered to be important sources, they were just rank and file. People. But of course, I think th this leads to another issue, which, which has to do with intentionality. We can look at the economics of the gulag and say it was highly unprofitable. It was, in the words of uh, Viktor Beninsky, often absurd. And yet, you can't fully understand that without understanding the in economic intentions, and as Golfo says, this is not just economics in, say, the kind of economics you would study in an economics department in a university, but the, you know, an economics which said that building socialism and, you know, uh, is the goal of rapid development and, you know, also isolating enemies is part of that and reforming, reconstructing society. So, I mean, you could say the same thing about punishment. There's the intentions, and even when intentions are not there, haphazard disorganization and many other features lead to de facto punishment. So one thing we have to get clear, and this goes to Judith Pallett's comment about the theor theor theorizing this is to be very clear about the, inten uh, the question of intentionality. Peter, please. We've got a lot of people uh, Okay, let's take let's a, several, take let's move to several com qu comments here. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, I'm not a historian. I belong to the French department. And uh, since we didn't have any discussion in the first part, I want to express my gratitude to my own department, to Michel Saab, for her most extraordinary presentation. It was a treat for us, uh, an event, a big event here in Georgetown, to see her back. She had the Grand Prix de l'Académie Française for her writing. She is not only an historian, as you see, a, a talented uh, novelist, she is a uh, passionate for justice. And in, her, in this quality, she wrote her two huge volumes, Regarde sur les Français, the history of France viewed for once through the women contribution, which are passed through silence through the centuries. And this same passion for justice directed her towards uh, Jacques Rossi, whom I had the good fortune at a difficult moment in my life to meet. Uh, I was writing my PhD dissertation 30 years ago on a little nook here in the library. And uh, I was disturbed one day, all of a sudden, next to me, tuk, 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 I could not concentrate. There was this noise. Where did it come from? I knocked at the door, and Jacques Rossi came out. What do you want? Oh, and you speak with an accent. Mais vous parlez français, and we started in French immediately. 
he was typing his big dictionary of the Gulag, starting alphabetically from memory, buried in papers. And on a little typewriter, manual typewriter, he was typing in Russian. Every morning for years to come, I made coffee for him. We go there. And we found six in common. He was born the same year my father was born. My father disappeared in 57 in communist Romania with no trial, with no public accusation. Tortured. And uh, we found him late in winter on the steps, half dead. Mother nourished him and he came back to life. Well, this about Jacques Rossi. Now about what is going on is our discussion here, if you allow me to say something. We, we you as historians, were looking at precedents. We're looking where did it come from. <coughs> well, I think of Pascal, teacher, French uh, literature. This is in human nature. If there are conditions which let us torture the other, it is going to happen. And that's why we have to be vigilant even here in our society to watch this not to happen. I like Alexis de Tocqueville. I used to read with my students while the Soviet uh, uh, Union existed. The, uh, the last chapter of Alexis de Tocqueville, De la Democratia en Amérique, which was written in 1935. And uh, I will read it and translate it and I will say what it is about. It's worth rereading it. Uh, I'm addressing myself to the students. It's extraordinary foresight. One, one, one wonders what type of education those people had to, to see the roots of the future development. And he says that, he compares, as we all know, in his conclusion, uh, how two big power will come in the next century to dominate the world, one through torture, lack of uh, uh, independence and freedom, and one through open society work and honesty. He was talking, of course, about what we, we later knew, the Union, the Union Sovietic and uh, America. And my students would say, well, I wouldn't say it's Alexis de Tocqueville, I wouldn't say where the text comes from, I would ask, what is it about? Oh, it's about communist uh, Union Sovietic, uh, the communist. I think communist, uh, uh, the communism took his main features from the Tsarist. I might be wrong, but I want you to discuss, you know. You just imagine if that would have been in France or in other country, but in France never. But anyway, I think he took that, that type. That's for the past. Now, for the, what happened to, to us, Romania, I was born there, educated there until I came here. Uh, what happened? It was modeled. The gulag phenomenon, the lack of freedom, was modeled in Romania. It became a model for Romania. Not only, as I said, about my father disappearing, but four regions of Romania, people were to be punished. Be punished to be born as a human being on that land, they were trans uh, the, transported the whole Banat region. Now, if you look at the Romania, it's like a big circle, having in the middle of the Carpathian Mountains, a beautiful country, by the way. And uh, Banat is on the western side, uh, a lovely region, rich, <coughs> developed under the influence <coughs> of. Uh, the German hard work in no half through the centuries. And it is a model in, in, uh, in, in organization. So what did the communists do? They took the people of the Banat from their home, just the way they were, and they put them in the southern part of Varakia of Romania, which was under the Turks for 500 years, you know, coming and going, all, all the, the forces that swept Europe, uh, invaders. And they 
put them there, the winds there come from directly from Siberia. There are no mountains to stop them. It's very cold in the winter, harsh conditions. To develop in that part, you know, forest labor, to develop like in Banat, uh, uh, the, the villages where it didn't work. And now there is a, a full literature from, from children to old people, who, but those who are still alive who write about this. And this is about Russia. You know, with Hitler, they took the eastern part of Romania, Basarabia, which they call it Moldavia, which now is a republic. What did they do to the citizens there? They put them into the gulag. They took their houses and they put Russian or Ukrainian there, and they send them. I have friends who ran away to Romania, but their father, their uncles, they were in the Gulag, just because they happened to be Romanian in their own country. I have a list of people who are wanting also to speak. Thank you very much. Daniel Beer, please. Um, I, I mean, I think that my, uh, this is sort of following on from Peter's um, comments about, about lenses, um, and, and it strikes me from my own, my own research sort of going back to the beginning of the, of the 19th century, that this question of, you know, whether do we see the gulag as, 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 I mean, on some accounts, sort of the quintessential expression of the modern state. So it's mm -hmm. sort of just, you know, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, following you know Claude Lefort or or or, or Bauman mm -hmm. and others. I mean, do we, you know? Do we see it as just this 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 sort of modern industrial titan that sees you know mm -hmm. human material you know mm -hmm. like like oil or coal to be moved around? Um, and I, I mean, I think I, that was probably what I. I mean, I, I think I've started to kind of question that 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 idea um, through through the lens of my own research because many of these. You know, many of these uh, themes that we see in, in the kind of contemporary scholarship on the Gulag about, you know, exclusion and about labor exploitation and about resources and about, you know, systems of punishment and, and grades of exclusion. I mean, they all seem to be present much earlier. I mean, sort of not, you know, throughout the 19th century, but actually in the 18th century as well. I mean, sort of using penal labor for, for resource exploitation. Uh, filtering prisoners, scales of punishment, uh, the notion that distance mm -hmm. from the metropole uh, is, is, is an indicator both of, of, of the extent of guilt and the severity of, of punishment. And so, I mean, I, I just, I mean, I'd, I'd like to kind of throw out, I have no answers, but just to throw out there this, this question of, of um, you know, do we see this is this actually something which has its roots in a pre-modern polity? Mm -hmm. uh, is the particular the particular configuration of of incarceration and violence within the Gulag is it a symptom of some sort of um, uneven development? I mean, mm -hmm. do we see sort of do we see a modern state building upon the residues, uh, obviously of a very extensive penal system which existed in the 19th century and one which left not just an institutional footprint in, in sites which were then revamped mm -hmm. and industrialized and sort of dragged into the, allegedly into the 20th century um, by the Stalin estate, but which also left um, sort of an imaginative footprint in, in, the, in the minds of servitors of the state, that, 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 that colonization and punishment are, are... And critics, like Solzhenitsyn. Yes, about. no, exactly, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd just like to sort of throw that out there. Thank you. Um, I would like to take a couple of more questions. Alain Bloom is next. Uh, a, a small one, but also about this question of precedent and uh, uh, comparison. Uh, because uh, when we compare this uh, Gulag and uh, former system of uh, camps and so, I think the danger is to compare the structure and to forget the question of the inclusion in the overall society of this system. And for example, in, imper in colonial system, uh, th there were very th two, two completely different societies, those who can come in camps and those who put in camps, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which was completely different. Uh, if we take the gulag, the question is that we cannot, all the society is concerned by the gulag. I think that, I don't know, 60% uh, of people in Soviet Union knows somebody who was close from him who, were, who has been in the gulag. Uh, in French colonial system, uh, nobody knows 
in France, somebody who has been in uh, Nouvelle Caledonia or so on, it was completely different societies. And I think that we have to take into account that when we compare the different systems. Mm -hmm. That is a place in the overall society and who is concerned by these different systems. Yes, please, gentlemen, right here. Uh, of the film that you're going to be seeing, we found the documents in Buchstab, in vast files, there were like a million files we were told. We went twice, the first time I was in there, saw the file of my father, actually. And then the second time, we were told all those files had been moved to a distinctive card. But what is the status today in, in Russia of finding the access getting access to these old files? Are they still available? Are they still taken care of? They're amazingly well preserved when I was there. Uh, can, one go, can one find them? Are they still around? Do they move them around? Can someone talk? Does anybody know of the status today to find if you were trying to research cases? OK. Um, yes, please. Uh, I just wanted to maybe build on some of the discussion about uh, maybe the uniqueness or not of the gulag. And also, in particular, I'm interested in this idea that the, the gulag is an object of study. Uh, it seems that, you know, there's the gulag and there's the, sorry. Uh, I'm interested in the gulag as an object of study, and I, I'm just wondering, in terms of, you know, we, we're talking about the gulag and we're talking about the Soviet Union, and this is part of a broader discussion of, you know, is it, uh, can we actually separate out the two at all, and is it worth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, is, is that even interesting at all to separate them out? Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm, I'm sort of curious as to, and I guess I'm reminded of the article that Kate Brown wrote in mm -hmm. critique of, of maybe a couple of years ago. She talks about these spaces of exclusion that progressively move out from the gulag, and that ultimately it's uh, our, our job uh, uh, to study the gulag is really we're studying a particular phenomena within Soviet society that has a particular features, but everything that we do in terms of studying it tells us a bit about the Soviet Union and vice versa. I guess this goes back to Peter's comment earlier about this sort of deep connection between the two. So I'm interested in what the panelists have to say in terms of how to how to be in if what one if such a thing exists, how to be a gulag scholar, but you know, in, in some fashion that it makes sense at all. Let's take one more question, and I will go to the panelist, Joshua Rubinstein. Yeah, uh, just very quickly, our focus has been on, on uh, systems that preceded the gulag, as if they inspired it or modeled for it, as if the gulag is the end point. The gulag is not an end point. Um, we've seen a tremendous number of prisoners in China. We have the experience of Cambodia in just those four years. Um, Rwanda doesn't fit in because they weren't interested in imprisoning anybody. They just wanted to kill them. Um, so it seems to me, and even when Amnesty famously or infamously said that Guantanamo was the gulag of our time, we didn't mean it literally, but we certainly meant it as a metaphor, <laughs> as a place with no law applied. Mm -hmm. So I think our, we should broaden our vision to see not only what, what led to the gulag, but what it further inspired. Which would include North Korea. Yeah. Uh, who would like to respond on the panel to any of this? Will you do the research side? Let me just uh, yeah, say on, the, on this absolutely one of the lenses that I had suggested was you know totalitarian or communist regimes and I, I, I do think the whole Ch Chinese and Karstori regime would be a wonderful point of cons comparison uh, for the Gulag and you're entirely right I mean my, my, my emphasis was on precursors but their legacies that carry on after that, that have not died with 54 or 57 um, so I, I, on that I think you're entirely right I just want to insist that this question about um, uniqueness, sui generis nature versus uh, comparability. Comparability doesn't mean that it's comparable. That one of the reasons of comparing is in fact to bring forth and to highlight what is distinctive. And so your particular point, uh, the shatter point that you want to stress is the Soviets were doing this to their own citizens. Clearly the Nazis have a huge camp regime. Your point here is what is distinctive about the Soviet side is that they're doing it to their own citizens. German Jews would obviously have a point to say about that, but um, one gets to that point by putting it in contrast with other regimes. So just the, the comparative uh, gesture is one that need not lead to uh, conflation uh, of all uh, systems. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, there have been a number of really interesting questions about what is the lens, what is the frame. Um, uh, you know, clearly we have, we have an argument this is a, a Russian czarist tradition 
Um, it goes, and, and one can cast this either in terms of Russian backwardness or in terms of Russian institutional history. This is the difference between Richard Pipes and Martin Malia. Is it Russian backwardness or is it, is it a, a totalitarian communist um, argument? Um, here I think Misha's point about scale becomes absolutely crucial. I mean, that there, there does seem to be a watershed not only in intentionality, but also simply in, in, in scale, both in intent and in, in consequence. And, and in dialogue with this, I think there was also a very interesting uh, dialogue here in terms of um, uh, uh, Alain's point uh, that gets to Asif's question of uh, to what extent, this was uh, in Viktor Berdinsky's paper, to what extent is the gulag separate from Soviet society, and to what extent is it an extension or um, sub-function of how all society um, is operating, um, which I think is, is a, a, a super point, a point that, that Alain was making. Yeah, I uh, very much agree with that. Uh, I want to say something about numbers. I think this is really important because I think it also ties in with distortion, the whole question of distortion. And this is something that is really very important in the context of the Gulag because you can read these documents, but you have to reread them and reread them because there are many things that they're not saying. There are things they're saying in particular ways. You have to comp cross compare material. I think that they very self-consciously veiled what they were doing and used language that veiled the, the uh, mass death that um, uh, existed. So I think that those of us who work with these materials have to be really aware of distortions, silences, veiled language. This is really important. So the whole question of can we know how many, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we'll ever know. And I say that because I, I read people write uh, from different camps saying things like, well, we couldn't record our mortality for this month because we didn't have any paper. And, you know, they don't, first of all, the way that they recorded mortality was really uh, very deceptive. Secondly, they often released people right on the verge of death to keep their mortality figures down. And so they, they did all sorts of things to make it more difficult to uh, really get at the scale of this phenomenon, the, um, the reality of mass uh, starvation. On the subject of starvation too, how they recorded illness was also uh, very deceptive. Um, again, as a way of veiling or covering, hiding the phenomenon of mass starvation. I'll leave it there. The question of numbers. Yeah. Um, as long as a society maintains uh, this denial, I mean, virtually, virtually everyone I talk to, an ordinary citizen in Russia, will not admit to the atrocities of the gulag. The, the general public will ask you, why are you studying this? This is negative, this is not interesting. Just sweep it under the rug. So uh, the, whereas in you know, Nazi Germany, the, when you study the figures, you can be put in jail in Germany for denying the, uh, for denying the Holocaust. No such thing will ever happen in the Soviet Union, in Russia, because uh, the, if the regime itself does not admit to the atrocities of the past. Of course, people aren't even going to be admitting it. Ordinary citizens do not read the literature. They don't know the figures. They don't visit memorials. It's, it's simply uh, uh, a case of, of being asleep. I want to add to this because this was a major question that I was mm -hmm. going to raise, but about the discussion of the gulag in Russia today. It's not just the lack of memorialization and the awareness and discussion in a broad scale, but in recent years among educated Russians, I've been hearing an argument about the sort of genesis and comparability of this, saying that modernization inevitably produces excesses. This was bad, there were victims, but, and then they go on to say, well, there were atrocities here and there. There were the uh, um, uh, Native Americans in the United States. And this was basically, it's implied, an inevitable sort of byproduct of modernization. And so I wanted to raise the question of how uh, this gulag phenomenon has been 
the treatment of it has actually been uh, changing in recent years along with uh, other changes in, in Putin's Russia. Now, I did have uh, Stephen Barnes here who wanted to ask a question. Can I answer about the access? It's actually uh, what I would like to respond to, uh, John. Uh, because it's precisely on this, this question that Alec Klebny raises on, uh, you know, I mean, it's not right that these documents were destroyed maliciously, it's that they were destroyed as part of a regular bureaucratic operation. Uh, it's just something that didn't interest them. Uh, but there are things at the local levels, I think, that, that could potentially help us with this question, and precisely the kinds of materials that you're talking about. I did uh, my local research in Kazakhstan, uh, and uh, when I was there in 2000, I was given wide access to precisely the kinds of materials you're talking about. Uh, individual prisoner files that often contained within them um, copies of these appeals that were being sent uh, to various places in Moscow. Uh, appeals that were being sent within the camp system to uh, the procuracy that was overseeing a particular camp, to the uh, uh, directors in a particular camp. These materials are, are potentially out there. It's not going to completely replace the 20,000 uh, letters a month, uh, but it might help us get at some of these kinds of things. Now, the issue is on the accessibility of these materials. Uh, and I think it probably, you know, to talk with Wilson, uh, it probably varies from location to location. And it certainly varies from time to time. I just came back from a few months uh, in which I returned to Kazakhstan, in which the very materials that I looked at in 2000 are completely inaccessible to scholars. Um, the story I was never able to find out exactly what happened or why. There were rumors flying about about various oligarchs who found bad things about their family and, and therefore wanted all of this stuff covered up. Uh, I don't know what the story is. In Kazakhstan, actually, they remember the Gulag quite readily. The president talks about it all the time. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these kinds of materials are or will always be available. Um, but I do have the feeling that the materials are there. Uh, and it's a, a matter of whether we can now or whether we will be able to, in the future, uh, get access to these kinds of materials. There is also, and I add, that there is a law that I have I don't think anything formally has changed, but the, the variation of access is quite wide depending on which place and there have been examples of reclassification that are that Stephen alluded to. Now we are, have a limited time left so I would take one more round of questions. Please keep them brief this time because we are going to move to the uh, documentary film but just uh, a few more questions and then we'll give the panelists a, a, the last word. Yes please. No, I just like the we are experiencing similar things uh, in Ukraine because we focused on Ukraine as the uh, uh, files in Moscow are pretty much are not accessible to us. But in Ukraine, we worked for one year, managed to work there pretty uh, easily, scan hundreds of documents, etc. But just yesterday, I received a letter from the SBU archive, the like, recent, recent uh, secret services of Ukraine, and they told me I can't no long, longer work in, in their archives. So it's, it's changing um, uh, every time, and especially in the UK, the situation is really deteriorating now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, um, I just wanted to follow up on the whole point of how the Gulag is being discussed in Soviet society, or sorry, <laughs> uh, Russian society today. And uh, what was especially interesting two years ago, the Human Rights, uh, the Presidential Human Rights Commission, led by Mikhail Fedotov, had proposed a plan for the memorialization of the victims of political repression and totalitarianism. And that was immediately dubbed as a de-Stalinization program and caused a huge furor in the press and in uh, Russian society. And in large part, I mean, looking at the discussions that went back and forth, it seemed to me that people were really scared that in judging Stalin or in acknowledging his crimes in some fashion, 
that the whole Soviet period would be viewed as criminal. And uh, then on the other hand, which is a really touchy point, is the fact that all the sacrifices that the nation had to sustain during World War II would be seen as for naught, for nothing. But there is a discussion going on, and it is um, at a fairly high level, but you know, there's not much movement. And one more question, Wilson. Well, just on that point, and they, they've also, um, so they did come out with a film series of Chalamov's Kalima Tales and a film series of uh, uh, First Circle, right? Uh, television series. And I've, I've seen most of the First Circle one. I haven't seen very much of the Kalima Tales. But the First Circle one seemed like a high quality um, production. And that was shown on uh, Gracia, I think. Both of them were shown on Gracia. So, I mean, so it's not like it's being silent. Right. There's discussion out there. Um, Thank you. Okay, I'm going to give anyone on our panel a last word to respond. I just want to return to a briefly underscore Judith Pallet's comments, which I, I'm very grateful for, about um, in, in terms of broadening uh, approaches, also going beyond particular disciplines. Let me point out, in terms of this debate about sources, this this is a debate that occurs, or a discussion that occurs at two levels. One about accessibility. Is, is the material there? Mm -hmm. Golfo is pointing to a different question, is can you get to the data? Are the types of documents that we need, this is also Alia Klebnyuk's point, and those are a question about sources in two different registers. Are they accessible? And then were they ever, were the type of documents that we would want to do the type of social, or I would describe it as anthropological history, mm -hmm. that Alia calls for, do they exist? Right. Right. Um, on the earlier discussion, I'm reminded of something Alexander wrote in his wonderful book um, that when in a, in a state that denies uh, its own violence, the act of mourning is a political act. And I think a lot of people now don't are shy about um, engaging in political acts, and that might uh, affect the way that uh, the gulag is remembered now. I just wanted to say one thing about socialism because the, the mm -hmm. S word hasn't come up this afternoon. And it is important uh, in, un, in appreciating the uniqueness of the gulag, uh, number one, the centrality of labor and how they understood labor and why labor was so important and why they refused to feed those who didn't work you know, that was because he who does not uh, work shall not eat. I mean, that was in the Soviet Constitution. So this was, you know, the whole ideology of labor is very important. And also, I want to just note something that Catherine Verdry uh, says about the nature of socialism. And she describes it as a, re as a system of redistribution. And this is also very important in the Gulag. Resources are routinely, systematically redistributed from the weak to the strong, from uh, the priority camp, from the non-priority camps to the priority camps. And this gets to the heart of what Jacques Rossi, and I'll end here with him, because when um, Michel Sartre mentioned that he described the cruelty of the camps as systemic and not personal, that is really the heart of the matter. Because you know, all of these rules were what made that system so unique and so uh, inhumane. You know, the people occupying it um, were just executing uh, the orders. Um, well, my final comment. Um, as a literary scholar, I'm amazed by the degree to which the historians among us are conducting the newest research on the Gulag. This is where the real new developments are taking place. Uh, while uh, we in literary studies are seeing a great deal of publishing occurring, there's nothing on the scale of the excitement, I would say, that historians have in discovering archives and in exploring avenues that have never been explored before. Just a testament to that, of course, is this con uh, conference. So I, I, applaud, I applaud you all because uh, I, I just wish similar currents were taking place in the literary field. We don't have conferences like this taking place uh, in literary studies other than individual authors who, who are explored or monographs that might be written. So really, uh, Thank I you so much, you. and please join me in, in thanking our three panelists.